So yes, China's policy in Xinjiang is not a mere issue of re-education, as he likes to put it. I know some people might go, mm, you can still love your country, but it doesn't mean that you have to defend it or agree with it all of the time. I 100% agree with this. Would I want my identity to be scrutinized by the state? Absolutely not. In fact, when I explain China's point of view, I'm not excluding the possibility that Okay, let's address the elephant in the room. I know for many China watchers, Xinjiang has been a bit of a hard bone to chew. It is one of the most important of our time. We are talking about a sovereign government. China's attempt at eradicating the Uyghur identity from its borders. With legal rights to deal with the threats of terrorism. The Chinese Communist Party has committed these crimes against humanity. Personally, I have been very resistant to talk about Xinjiang because the terms concentration camp and genocide carry such a strong reference to the Holocaust that there's this immediate moral pressure to condemn China. You almost feel like you have no choice but to say the right thing rather than to explore what you think to be the truth. I will admit, I really had a hard time with these terms because I don't think they are accurate. But at the same time, I also wouldn't call it schools. I went to Xinjiang a while ago and that experience was an interesting one. What do you think? Passing a beautiful mosque on my way home. I did end with more questions about English media, but I also realized that China's response is not entirely convincing. So this video will be my humble attempt to make sense of the Xinjiang situation. It's going to be a ride as we explore the big questions about China. First, let's start with a plain description. So if you're looking at China's decision to place some Uyghur people into facilities for language and political education, it limits their life for a long time, but most of these people haven't committed an actual crime. I'm going to call it correction facilities. China also revised the Uyghur culture by reassessing if certain cultural products, practices and texts are appropriate on the market and took down those it considered not. In response, China said this is to prevent terrorism and to protect Xinjiang's safety. For example, there have been more than 200 terrorist attacks since the 1990s, and also the fact that China borders Afghanistan, where there's a heavy presence of the jihadist threat. But still, many critics said China overestimated the threat of terrorism and have been using this as an excuse to subjugate the Uyghur minority. Normal people, like a Uyghur Muslim working at a shoe factory, are really unlikely to be thinking about staging a riot, so probably don't deserve to be there. So China doesn't have a real legitimate reason. Now clearly, we have a moral split, so the question we're answering is, what has caused this split and how to make sense of the so-called China's heavy-handed policies? Well, the root cause for the split is the fact that China and the pro-independence Uyghur community have fundamentally different views on Xinjiang's identity. So, what is the difference? Let's start with the Uyghur diaspora first. In the 20th century, with the rise of nation-state, some Uyghur communities scattered in China and Soviet Central Asia developed a political narrative. It said that Uyghurs should have their own history, politics and national religion that emphasize the place as a distinct nation in their homeland, Xinjiang. They said that the Uyghur Turkic tribes since the 9th century had been Xinjiang's habitant with a long tradition of nation building, and the states established by them were fully independent. Xinjiang became a Chinese colony when China declared it a province in 1884. Since then, the Uyghur people had a record of resistance against China including two short periods of East Turkestan in 1933 and 1944. They see China as a colonial settler that shouldn't have control over the region. So the terrorist attacks claimed by China is not entirely terrorism. If we exclude the attacks on innocent civilians, the other parts of the attacks, such as the attacks on government and the police, are actually a national liberation struggle against colonial settlement. It is a strife for independence and rightfully so. Those who attack military, police and the state institutions for such purposes should be understood as engaged in guerrilla warfare. From this line of thinking, Xinjiang should be completely free from the Chinese influence. China's correction facilities and its efforts to reassess and synthesize the Uyghur people and their culture, for example, by teaching them Mandarin, renovating mosques and banning the calves, are unacceptable. 
because not only China doesn't have the legitimacy, but also it takes away the quintessentially Uyghur element. This is the premise of all the reports that criticize China for raising a campaign to destroy the Uyghur identity. The underlying problem in Xinjiang is not terrorism per se, but Chinese rule over the Uyghur homeland. Now for China, this narrative is problematic because its approach to politics is Eurocentric. China is very old, so it is insufficient to understand Xinjiang only through the eyes of nation-state, which is a modern term that defines a country as having only one system and one cultural and political identity. Well, it hasn't always been the case for China. In China's narrative, which dates back all the way to the Han Dynasty in 60 BCE, the Chinese government had already established state institutes such as military garrisons and protectorate to signify its rule over Xinjiang and the Huns. These state departments continued and later expanded into more sophisticated forms such as setting up administration counties, assigning ranks to tribe leaders and a tribute system. Even if it is a different system from the rest of China, all of these already suggested that China had long established sovereignty over Xinjiang. Besides, to see Chinese people as only Han Chinese is very mistaken. Since the very beginning of history, Chinese refers to a hybrid cultural tradition that was based on the teachings of Confucianism, but also included elements from other non-Han cultures. China had been overrun by several foreign peoples who were subsequently assimilated into the Chinese culture and who also became the successors and the promoters of the Chinese civilization. Chinese, in the real sense of the word, refers to Zhonghua Mingzhu, the collective Chinese nations that encompasses other 55 Chinese ethnic minorities. You can even relate it to the term American. It doesn't just include white American, but also Asian American, Black American, and Hispanic American. So Uyghurs, just like other Chinese minorities of the Huis and the Mongols, is a part of the Chinese civilization. Now, the internet and the Western support of Uyghur diaspora has brought new challenges to protecting Xinjiang's territorial integrity. China is particularly concerned with Uyghur's connection to outside influences that highlight their linguistic and religious difference to push for a separation agenda. The real threat in Xinjiang is Uyghur's sympathy for East Turkestan. That's why China keeps insisting that it is fighting terrorism because none of the national liberation struggle is acceptable. Now the question is, how does China translate this into things like correction facilities? For Chinese authorities, the concern isn't just about the violent terrorist attacks on the surface, but the more hidden, insidious, psychological influence that plays a bigger role in sabotaging people's loyalty. China is generally concerned with the prospect of people using religion as a disguise to spread Uyghur nationalism. For example, it attacks a recent pan-Islamic trend in Xinjiang where people began to sell halal items that are not related to food, such as halal tissues, halal utensils, and halal soap. This has encouraged people to demand things like halal checkout counters, halal bathrooms, and public services that are only exclusive to Uyghur Muslims. Eventually, it turns so intense that some people even stop sending their children to schools because they prefer the self-organized Uyghur Islamic academies to replace formal education, which is of course illegal in China. The way China sees it is that it has not only encouraged people to reject some important aspects of being a Chinese citizen, but it has also encouraged a self-isolating environment that might have promoted sympathy for a Uyghur state. So, normal people is exactly where the real danger breeds. I would argue, the less spoken intention behind China's revision policy to redefine the Uyghur culture and its appearance is China's desperate efforts to reassert the Chinese identity. So Uyghur people are only loyal to China, to identify with China, and to imagine China as this overarching high-level identity even if they have received strong cultural influence from other parts of the world. Okay, now let's have a sit-down chat about this. I know some people might go, mm, you can still love your country, but it doesn't mean that you have to defend it or agree with it all of the time, no matter what it does. I 100% agree with this. Would I want my identity to be scrutinized by the state? Absolutely not. In fact, when I explain China's point of view, I'm not excluding the possibility that China might have made some people feel targeted and wronged. The conversations that I had in Xinjiang also made me realize that it is just unwise to deny the intensity of things. For example, if you wear burqa, that would be a reason for you to go to correction facilities. As well as the prospect of heavy-handedness when China was dealing with people who believe they don't deserve to be there and 
and who didn't want to comply. But I also don't want to hide my reservations about the accusations out there because there are reports that shows some of these Uyghur testimonials are false. The point is the current reports available just don't capture the moral maze and the purpose of this video is to explore a narrative that makes sense to me and hopefully makes sense to some people. Now, what about the prospect of heavy-handedness? And I think that Xinjiang also is an interesting case that shows how China's political system interacts with foreign influence or rhetorics that it finds hostile. I'm going to use an idea by Mao from IC49, which I think can help interpret this, because this is an idea that was later enshrined into the Chinese constitutions. You are dictatorial. My dear sirs, you are right. That is just what we are. All the experience the Chinese people have accumulated through several decades teaches us to enforce the people's democratic dictatorship. That is, to deprive the reactionaries, meaning any groups or countries that try to undermine China's sovereign or territorial interest, of the right to speak, the state apparatus, including the army, the police, and the court, is the instrument by which one class oppresses another. It is an instrument for the oppression of antagonistic classes. It is violence and not benevolence. You are not benevolent. Quite so. We definitely do not apply a policy of benevolence to the reactionaries. Our policy of benevolence is applied only within the common people. This might seem like it is validating the West's assessment of China's politics. But what it means is that the founding of the PRC was after decades of humiliating struggle against the foreign invasion and influence that had kept it poor and fractured. Now China has learned better, so to the Chinese people, it will be good and benign, but to the people who are under the influence of the so-called anti-China influence, for lack of a better word, it just will have to do things differently. So yes, China's policy in Xinjiang is not a mere issue of re-education, as it likes to put it. The essence is still about using politics to deal with what China regards as its enemies. It is not precisely the Uyghur people, but some expressions of their acquired identities that China finds to be incredibly dubious under the rise of the Uyghur nationalism. To sum up this point, the Xinjiang controversy is about two competing identity narratives between China and the Uyghur diaspora based on their different views on history. For Uyghurs, the problem is China's rule over their homeland, but for China, the problem is Uyghur's sympathy for independence. So what China does in Xinjiang is to use a mix of education and force to reinforce the Chinese identity. So Uyghur people identify with China and are protected from influence that might sabotage their loyalty. I'm going to end with a quote from one of my favorite philosophers, Niccolò Machiavelli, who has wrestled with these questions hundreds of years ago. It would be an excellent thing if a ruler were to have all of the good qualities and none of the bad. But since he can't have or practice all of these qualities all of the time, a ruler must take care to avoid feelings that might lose him his position. A ruler mustn't worry about being labelled cruel when it's a matter of keeping his subjects loyal and united. Using a little exemplary severity, he will prove much more compassionate than the leader whose excessive compassion leads to public disorder, muggings and murder. Alright, that's all for Xinjiang. I hope it doesn't push you too far out of your comfort zone. If you're still watching, you are the best and thank you for staying. And I will see you in the next one. When I explain China, I'm also very much aware of the limits of my thinking. First of all, my cultural background has limited the extent to which I criticize China. Me being born a Han Chinese in a wealthy city also interfered with my ability to sympathize with the Muslims, who are indeed vulnerable to China's societal prejudice.